And finally, let's move to electrolytic cells. These are the opposite of the galvanic cells we studied earlier. Remember earlier, electrons flowed from the more active metal to the less active metal, from the anode to the cathode. It was the least reactive metal that was reduced. In the case of electrolytic cells, we're using an electron pump. And so in this case, electrons are moving to the more active metal, although it still keeps the negative designation because it is the most active metal. That is an inherent property. It nevertheless becomes the cathode because that is the site at where reduction is now occurring. And the least active metal, it still remains its po keeps its positive sign because it is inherently the least reactive, the lesser reactive metal, but it nevertheless becomes the anode because electrons are now moving away from it. Probably one of the most famous electrolytic reactions is that called a down cell. And it's the process by which we make sodium and chlorine. These are both very, very reactive chemicals. Of course, sodium is so reactive, it will even react with water and the moisture in the air. You're not going to go out and dig up sodium from somewhere. It's just too reactive. It has to be made, and then it has to be very carefully stored. It's not a natural process that sodium forms. As a matter of fact, if you look at the production of sodium and chlorine gas from none other than sodium chloride, you will see that the voltage is negative. But you can get the reaction to go. You just have to apply enough current so that this becomes positive. In other words, you have to use an electron pump, a voltage source. In other words, an electrolytic reaction. And that's what happens in this case, where you, where you take table salt and you react it and make chlorine gas and sodium by way of a voltage source. So let's work a real quick question here. During the manufacture of sodium metal, how many volts of electricity are produced? It's a trick question. The answer is none. No voltage are produced. You have to add voltage. Voltage has to be applied. You're not getting any voltage out. Really quickly, the electronics of, of uh, aqueous sodium chloride I just wanted to point out here that water is your solvent, and so at the anode, there's a possibility that you can have water that's also getting in to the uh, oxidation activity. And not only is sodium being reduced, sodium ion being reduced, but likewise, water can be reduced, as can hydrogen ions. So there's a lot that can go on in these chemical reactions. You can't always ignore water. Speaking of water as a reactant, here it is quite simply laid out. Water can be reduced to hydrogen gas, and water can also be oxidized to give you oxygen. And I've actually done some reactions, maybe, or the car battery where I was removing rust. So I was running the process backwards as it were. And what happens is I have, I had bubbles at both my cathode and my anode at both of those electrodes. And the bubbles coming off from one anode was actually hydrogen gas and the bubbles coming off of the other was oxygen. And by the way, that is an explosive, an explosive combination. And so one, do not try this at home, but two, if you do it, make sure you do it out in your yard or something. Right, very quickly, carbon is such an important element. I wanted to just remark on an observation about the oxidation numbers. Carbon can have an oxidation number, everything from minus four to plus four. 
And if you've ever seen anyone who could just look at some react, say, oh, it's oxidizing or it's reducing, and they do it very, very quickly, you might wonder, how did they ever do that in their head so quickly? And the answer is they probably didn't. They looked at the general series here and they know what's basically happened. Two things. One, you can see as bond multiplicity increases, the oxidation number of carbon increases. And so as you go from a carbon species from one to a double bond to a triple bond, you'll see that the oxidation number increases. And furthermore, as you start adding oxygens, the oxidation number increases. So it's pretty easy to look at a carbon that's gained bond multiplicity in the reaction or gained oxygens and to know that it's been oxidized. Simple problem. Calculate the number of electrons that have a total charge of one coulomb. Let's analyze that. It's asking you for the number of electrons. And it only gives you one given value, and that is you're starting with one coulomb. So you set up the dimensional analysis that reads, how many electrons do I get starting with one coulomb? At that point, it's very simple matter to recall what we talked about earlier, and you're going to for coulombs to moles, and moles of electrons to number of electrons, and there you have it, a simple two-step dimensional analysis problem. Let's work another one. Calculate the standard reduction potentials of H plus going to H2, the sheet electrode, and oxygen and hydrogen going to water. We know the voltage for that standard cell is 1.229 volts. What is E cell when the pressure of H2 is 3 atmospheres and O2 is 1.25? Well, what do we have here? We know we have the E for the standard cell. It's asking us for E for the cell as it exists and non-standard conditions. We're also given information about the products, H2 and O2. So we now have a relationship between E and concentrations. And usually when you see that, the potential as a function of concentration, it's probably what? The Nernst equation. And here's what that's going to look like. These are the two reactions that they gave. We write them down. And we figure out the E for our standard cell. We now know that. We know RTF. We've gone through that before. That's that. So what would N be? N in this case is going to be what? Four. Those were the number of electrons that we had to cancel out. So we now know that. We just calculated EO for the cell, as I mentioned there. And finally, we have to do this Q part, our products and reactants. And that's where this information comes in, right there. So that's Q. We're not at equilibrium. How do you know? Because we would only be looking for EO cell here. We now have an E cell value. Our battery is not dead, as it were. So what is Q? Well, we have to know how to put our old expressions for that. It's 1 over what? Our product here, but that's a pure material, so the activity is 1. Our partial pressure of H2 squared. Our partial pressure of oxygen. And we plug the numbers in, and we get 0 0.889. And so now we know this number. We now have one equation and one unknown. We plug the values in here, a little bit of algebra, and there we go. 1.245 volts is the answer. 
Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know that you've seen this reaction before. You saw it when we dealt with the corrosion of iron. It was the reduction half cell. One final question. What is the silver ion concentration in a half cell if the reduction potential of the silver ion silver couple is 0 0.40 volts? So what do we know? What do we ask about? We're asked for a concentration and we're given a potential. Well, as usual, what's the equation that normally relates those two? Again, it's the Nernst equation. Here's what it looks like worked out. We know in this case, we can have one equation and one unknown for it to be solvable. And the thing that we're looking at is the concentration of our silver ion, our reactant in this case. So let's take an inventory. Do we know what the concentration of our product is? Yes, it's a solid. It has unit activity. It's one. We know those constants. What is N? We look at our equation and we can see that exactly one electron is being transferred in our cell. Do we know the standard cell potential? Absolutely. We look in our table and we find that this is 0 0.7996. And do we know E cell? What was actually given in the problem? At that point, we have one equation and one unknown. It's just a matter of working through the algebra at that point and coming up with 1.8 times 10 to the minus 7. That's the answer to this question, and that's the end of this chapter.